you want, if you want a single source of plant for different seasons of the year, so that one from Michigan State is a good one. Uh, it's, uh, Michigan State attractive promoting and protecting pollinators. So I forget the exactly what it's called, but you can find it there. It's, it's a PDF and you can download the thing and put it off what you want to. Tape it up on the, on the, on the shelf wall so you can remember. Okay. Now, talk about insect or pesticides for a moment because a pesticide, sometimes when you use the term pesticide, people talk about things that kill bugs. Well, okay, an insecticide is a pesticide that kills bugs. An herbicide is a pesticide that kills weeds or plants. A fungicide is a pesticide that controls or kills fungal organisms. Okay, a bactericide is a pesticide that works against bacteria, etc., etc. Okay, so they're all pesticides, things to control pests. Botanicals versus synthetics. A botanical or a natural pesticide is derived from a natural source, plant or animal. Okay, mostly from plant. Okay, mostly from plant. Off the top of my head, I can't name one that is animal based. All right, but I'm not going to tell you there's not some out there. <coughs> but the majority of those natural pesticides, the insecticides especially, are going to be plant based. Uh, some of the fungicides are plant based, not all. Synthetic pesticides are those which are formulated synthetically. You know, they're, they're created in a lab. If you, want to, if you want to stretch the definition, I guess, if organic matter came from this work of earth, well, everything is made very loud came from this earth. So that's probably a stretch. Though. That's probably a bit of a stretch. But that's the difference. Botanicals and natural products are derived from plant or animal. So, again, we already said some of these things. Uh, just because organic or natural doesn't mean it can't be toxic. Organic insecticides have specific modes of action, just as do synthetic insecticides. You know, they work against the energy formation, they work against, uh, well, they, they asphyxiate, they work on the nervous system, etc. Now, a thing to keep in mind is that beneficial in insecticides have one job, and that is to control the insects. It cannot tell the difference. An insecticide, doesn't matter what kind it is, it cannot tell the difference between a beneficial insect or a pest insect. So you've got to be judicious when you apply these things, you know, common sense. For example, if plants are in full bloom, let's say apples, and you're wanting to control, you know, plum curios, all right, well, you don't go out spraying insecticides in the middle of the day when that apple tree is blooming with, with any insecticide without the danger of harming beneficial insects because that product cannot tell the difference between a good one and a bad So you've got to be careful about that. Okay, you got to be careful about that. Now, uh, now one, one of the things about organic insecticides is they typically dissipate very rapidly. So you can treat today and not worry about any residue tomorrow in a lot of those cases. So that is, a, that, that, is, that is the reason behind statements like less toxic. Okay? Toxicity does not remain as long. But insecticidal soap is a pretty good insecticide. Okay, it's an organic product. It's derived from potassium salts and fatty acids. Basically, it, it desiccates them. Okay, it, it, it uh, helps them, it dries them out. That's what it does. It destroys the membrane, and the, the, they, they leak all their fluid out. And they dry. It's kind of like horrible death, doesn't it? Um, insecticidal soaps are contact only. What does that mean? That means if you spray a plant, you, and aphids are good examples of critters controlled by insecticidal soap. If you spray, a uh, plant that has aphid population on it, and you don't hit some of those aphids, you do not control those aphids because they're contact on it. You know, once, once, once the spray is dried, it's, it's stewing. If you miss this guy, you miss it. You spray the plant, it walks through the spray, they'll do it again. You've got to cover the, the critter with the spray. So it's contact on it. Works good on soft bodied insects. It's not going to kill hard bodied insects. Works on soft bodied insects. Uh, aphids, three ups up here. This, if anybody has a lot of plants, you've probably seen these before. If you haven't, just keep looking, you will, because it'll show up. It's you on a scale. Now, it, it's not going to control these. These are adult scales, but it will control the larval, the, the nymph scales, the crawlers, the soft body scale, the reproductive side. Uh, spider mites, two spotted spider mites, it, if you get them, it'll kill these. Uh, plant bug, anybody have roses? And you have the little gray spots on the rose leaves? It's this guy right here, rose slug. Little big, teeny, almost translucent, green worm. 
It's the larva of a, of a saw fly. Okay, you set aside a soap, you hit those guys right there, you'll kill them. You'll do it. Dormant oil or cultural oil, a lot of those are petroleum based, it can be plant based. They work by smothering. Okay, they plug the cuticles, the, the, the pores in the cuticles, the, the, the exterior, the skin, the covering of those insects, and you can't breathe. That's how they work. Um, it works on lots of different critters, scale insects especially, good on them because adult scales don't move and they're protected, okay? They have their little armor coating over them. So this, if you get a good coating of the oil on there, it smothers them, it covers them up so they can no longer breathe. Also, eggs, the, the scale eggs, uh, mite eggs, things like that, it will, it will smother them as well. Uh, it, so it can be used uh, in a lot of in a lot of places uh, for a lot of different pests. But again, it's a contact on the material. If you don't get it on the critter, then you didn't control the critter. That's why a thorough coverage is so essential on these products. Also, if you're using an oil, you're going to mix it with water. Well, what, the, the oil and water mix very well. No, they don't. So you've got to continuously agitate the spray mixture so it doesn't settle out. So that you're not spraying all oil in all water or vice versa. Want to keep it mixed up so you got an emulsion. And, and there are a lot of different kinds, okay? Uh, you have to pay attention. There are some cautions to using oil. I think I've got that in another slide. But these are all things that oil will control. Right up here, these are, okay, spider mites, spider mites, spider mite eggs, right here. These are scale insects. These are adult scale. They're like barnacles. These are on a little tree branch right here. These are, so we saw the little white scales in the previous slide on the euonymus, on the back side of the leaf. That's what they are magnified, okay? These are the adults, so the oil will, will smother those. Uh, these are white fly larva, nymphs, right over here. They look kind of pretty, don't they? Little dark spot with lace here around them. You see them in white. Like, what in the world is that? A scale. It's not a scale. It's a white fly larva. And they're a lot of different white flies. But they all have a look kind of like that. Oil will kill them if you hit them. Now, thing is, those are on the bottoms of the leaves. These are on the bottoms of the leaves. A lot of times these uh, spider mites are on the undersides of leaves on broadleaf plants. So if you come to and you spray the plant, you may not hit them. It's trouble, you know, you gotta work to do this. So you've got to spray the top of the plant and then direct your wand, your spray up to underneath. You don't just stand at the bottom and do it. You got to spray, move up, spray, move up, spray. So you do a good job of cooking. Um, there are some species that are sensitive to oils. And I, there's some of those are listed there. And you can find those. But maples, you know, especially Japanese red maples, uh, jupers, cedars, and spruce are sensitive to oil sprays. Pay attention to temperatures on those. If you've got a Colorado blue spruce and you spray it with horticulture oil, you have a Colorado green spruce. It turns it from blue to green until new growth comes back out and then we blue. Uh, temperature cautions, labels will tell you don't apply below 90 degrees, don't apply below 40 degrees. Today might not be a bad day. Lower humidity, sunshine, you like for the lower humidity so the oil will evaporate pretty fast after you apply it. Uh, you know, so in, in, in the middle of the summer, it's 90 degrees at uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, humidity is pretty high. You might want to wait and do your spray until after the sun goes down. Okay? You might want to do that. Neem oil is another oil that's dry from the plant. It's dry from this Asian neem tree, Asdiracta indica. The compound is called Asdiractin or Asdiracin. It's taken from it. Uh, <laughs> it's not a poison, in fact, that it instantly kills insects but it can deter feeding, it can cause them to stop feeding. Um, so it's a feeding deterrent. Uh, some think it may act as a growth regulator, it may break up the life cycle of some of these pests so that maybe they don't reproduce as readily. Uh, over position suppressive, meaning the females aren't out there depositing eggs, implants, a sterile and a toxin. Well, that's, that's like some bad stuff. Really. It's a, uh, it, um, you'll see it used in, in a lot of, there are a lot of products offered with neem oil in it, okay? A lot of products are offered that have neem oil in there. And you'll see them on the shelves and so on. Most of, most of the, well, from the insecticide standpoint, you know, they work pretty good applying when the pest is present. 
but as you'll see in just a moment, from a disease control standpoint, I'll, I'll point out something else about that. I'll just wait and see. But again, chewing, the neem oil is more effective on chewing insects than sucking insects. So aphids are sucking insects. So you typically aren't going to get a good control uh, if you might on some other things. Uh, but uh, it will control aphids. You know, if you get any covering on it, it'll kill them. But chewing insects like uh, uh, caterpillars, okay, Japanese beetles, things like that, it works pretty good on them. It can work pretty good. It'll also kill some of those same ones. That uh, This is a lace book right here. If you're not familiar with what lace book looks like. But it will kill some of those same insects we've seen showing up time and time again in these previous slides. Pyrethrin-based uh, insecticides, pyrethrin or pyrethrin, it's, it works on the nervous system. It's derived from the uh, uh, percent. Okay, it's plant-based. Uh, I mean, it's a genuine insecticide. It kills, all right? That's what it does. Um, it doesn't last long, so it doesn't have long residual, but it'll work against a lot of different critters. It'll kill uh, stink bugs, plant bugs, things like that. If you've got you know, cucumber beetles, if you've got squash bugs, things like that, you want to use a real low toxicity product. And it's called low toxicity because it degrades rapidly. All right? I mean, it's, it's toxic to a lot of things. You don't want to spray honey bees, it'll kill them. All right, you want to spray good insects because it'll kill them. But you spray in the evening when you're not going to have honeybees and pollinators out there, you don't worry about them coming by tomorrow and then visiting those flowers because it's not going to be around to, to bother them anymore. So that's one of the benefits of some of these lower, or some of these uh, uh, no residual kind of products. Okay. That can be a blessing, it can be a curse, depending on what your point of view is on that. Does that also have to be sprayed it's a, on the bottom side of the... Well, it is, it, it is, uh, it is more of a contact, but it is not as much contact uh, if a critter comes along and feeds them before it dries up too rapidly, then they'll still control it. Okay. Because they'll ingest it. But, it, I mean, it, 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 uh, uh, they do have to get it in them somehow, and it dries and goes away fairly fast, so you don't get a lot of long term. You probably got, and you know, I'll be guessing if I told you how long that is, but you know, depending on how, how what the drying conditions are, but typically tree you got 30 minutes to an hour of control in there. If you didn't get that critter in and crawl through it or her to crawl through it and ingest it, still get some benefit out of it. So those are examples of the critters that will feed on. We've already seen a lot of these. Here's one you haven't seen. Yes, you have, but you didn't see it in this form. Anybody know what that is? We saw we saw a stink bug before, right? Wow. Green stink bug, that's a baby green stink bug. That's what it is. That's a nymph. Green stink bug nymph. Uh, lace bugs, and then those are plant bugs, they're beetles. I mean, you know, they, I don't, they don't look like Japanese beetles exactly, but they kind of color like Japanese beetles. We'll just say it's a Japanese beetle one bee. How about that? I'll let it go with that. Rotenone is a, is a plant based uh, alkaloid, it comes from tropical legumes. Uh, it, it works against, or it, 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 inter, it, it interrupts the production of energy in these critters. What it does. Uh, it's a stomach, so they can feed on it. Okay, it will stick around for a little while. It, it suggests it can remain potent two to three days after application. It depends on whether it rains, how bright the sunlight is, etc. It can be applied as dust. Dust tends to stay around longer than the spray because you have a larger degree of residue on there. But if if the critter is not there today and you've applied this, you can long feed on it tomorrow. They ingest it. You got the critter. So it does have some residual benefit to it. A lot of chewing insects, as well as some sucking insects, especially the sucking insects, if they are present when you spray them, if you contact them with it. Okay. Road known. You also, if you have a fish pond, you want to re rejuvenate your fish pond, renovate your fish pond, if you get a lot of trash fish in there, the birds are brought in, you rub them on the pond, fill all the fish in, start all over again. That's an old an old practice that's been used for years and years, rubbing on the kill. The, the aquatic life in a pond, so you can start all over the fish population is out of balance. And these are examples of uh, plants that, that uh, wrote on will kill. This is a leaf hopper, it's a chewer. Anybody know what this one is? A lot of people, we get calls about this one in the spring and in the fall because it congregates on the sides of people's houses. That's a box elder bug. <coughs> box elder bug. Box elder bug. Now here's Japanese beaver right here. Chew it in, say, chew it. And, and you know, these get on the house, they don't hurt them on the house. They eat the, like the seeds on, on maple type trees. Maple and ash and things like that. They don't really hurt them to piss. When they get, they're like ladybugs, they'll get in the house and on the side of the house and so on. Um, leaf hoppers, they feed on, the, the, they chew. You know, grasshoppers, things like that, chew on folks, they don't suck on. Spinosa, that's pretty good. This kind of neat stuff right here, spinosa. 
It's a, a works on the nervous system. It is derived from the fermentation juices of soil bacteria. And you can call it whatever you want to. Uh, Saccharum polysporospinosis is what I'm going to call it. I don't know if that's right or not, but that's what I'm going to call it. Now, the neat thing about it is it was first found in abandoned rum distillery on the Caribbean island in 1982. It was found there. I had somebody find it. I don't know what were they looking for. I have no <laughs> idea. But there, and this is a brand, all kinds of brands stuff. But Bonide is a line of uh, uh, consumer uh, pesticide, and they have a, a, a product called Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. And that's what it is, Spinoza. And I figure they're going back to the uh, the, 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 the rum roots right there, Captain Jack's in the Caribbean Island, Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. But this is a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good insecticide. Uh, it controls a lot of different insects. Uh, you can see some of those listed here, but also it'll control fire ants. Okay. Uh, now it'll kill it'll kill the uh, honeybees. It'll kill good insects if you spray it on. The thing about it is, if you spray today, once everything's dry, you don't worry about killing good insects tomorrow. It doesn't stick around very long. It works really good. It works really good. Uh, the organic growers today of vegetables, they probably could not produce insect-free, worm-free cabbages and, and uh, kale and lettuce and things like that without this product. It is really, really, really good against those, those chewing caterpillars and uh, uh, the larval stages, a lot of these, the worm stages of these insects. But it works good against uh, some of the uh, other stages too. Like if you have the fire ant, the three up right here, Anybody ever seen one of these? Now this is not near as big as it is in that picture right there. Seen a lot of thrips this spring already on uh, roses. People have roses, not rose rosette. They have roses where the buds, man, they're just ugly looking. They're kind of brown around the edges. They don't open up very pretty. And and they, when they do open up, they're smaller, and they just have not grown out, and they just got brown margins around the leaf petals or around the flower petals. You cut into them, you find these thrips. It's a pretty big agronomic pest too. Thrips are really bad on cotton and some other crops out there. Bagworms. Spinoza does a good job on bagworms, especially if you catch them before they seal the bags up. They can do a good job on killing bagworms because you got to spray them. That's the thing. But it's uh, you know it, it dries and then once it's dried, it's pretty safe for other pests or for other insects. Okay, this BT product. This is a, this is a uh, this is a come. It, it, it's an organism. Okay, BT stands for Bacillus. But in, in, in B, B, BT is Bacillus thuringiensis, and this uh, Kerstachy is the particular strain of that organism. That strain, this <coughs> Kerstachy, works against leaf eating caterpillars. Okay? So if you've got, if you're growing broccoli, cauliflower, things like that, you get worms in those. You can use this product. It's like you use spinosa, it does a good job against them. Dipel, Javelin, those are all brand names. Only on caterpillars, but work on other stuff. But there are other strains that are effective against the other pests. You know, mosquito. You hear about people using things in water to kill the mosquito larvae. Well, that's what it is. It's Bacillus thuringiensis, and that one's called Israelius, and it's, I think it's the correct time to term for it. But they're different BT organisms for different pests. They work on the larval stage. Corn earworms, that's another one. Corn root borers. Uh, they're BT products that will kill those, okay? It's, you know, where you put it in pond, you don't worry about livestock drinking out of it, you don't worry about people swimming in it, you don't worry about any of that kind of stuff. It works only against those larval stages of those organisms, those, those pests out there. They can be pretty good. Milky spore is another uh, pathogenic bacteria that can be applied to uh, soils to help control Japanese beetle larvae only. Okay, it doesn't work on other kind of drugs, Japanese beetle larvae only. Uh, it's, boy, you can hear a lot of debatable how effective it is. The key to it, number one, is you got to put a live organism in the ground. And you've read some stories, uh, some reports, where the retail folks didn't store the stuff right, and what they sold you was dead bugs, basically. And so you just put a, uh, an inactive, a benign powder on the ground, and it can take <coughs> organisms to grow and populate. So, you know, it's kind of hit or miss uh, whether it's going to work for you or not. It's a slow process that you've got to inoculate the ground and the bacteria's got to grow a little population uh, in order to have enough there to, to, to have an impact on those organisms. 
but you can see at the top picture up there, the bug on the, the grub on the left, how it's got the, uh, the black abdomen down there, the one on the right's white. The one on the left has is, is been infected with the bacteria. It's not here to make an adult. That's what it does. Now, weed control, real quick, we'll line it up with weed control. Uh, you know, selectivity and weed control. From, from an organic standpoint, it's almost soon to nothing. Selectivity means you spray it on one plant, it'll kill this weed, and it won't kill that plant over there. For organic products, that's just soon to nothing. A few years ago, an iron based product came out, a chelated iron product called Fiesta. Uh, uh, there was hope that it was going to, well, it was touted it was going to work on like that. It just hasn't done. It has done. Most organic herbicides are contact only, and they, they're, they're a desiccant, they, they top burn. They burn what's above the ground, and if it's a perennial plant, it doesn't destroy the root system or the rhizomes or whatever, it'll regrow. Okay? If it's an annual plant, if, it, if, it, if that root system doesn't have enough energy to regrow the top, then you control it. But if it does, it's going to grow right back. pre emergent weed control uh, in, in lawn areas using organic products is somewhat inconsistent. Uh, Typically, if you're going to have an organic to manage lawn, learn to enjoy the diversity of plants. Because you probably have, you're going to probably have some plant diversity in there. Yeah, you have some diversity of plants in there. And that's okay. You know, green is good. It all helps the whole world together. It does. It does. Mulches are very beneficial, especially in landscape beds when it comes to weed control standpoint. A couple of things. And I do ask this question is weed shut an accurate term? Well, not plant killer is probably a more accurate kind of plant killer because most of these organic products are not going to differentiate between one plant or another. It can't differentiate between weed or a tomato plant. Okay, so weed killer is not an accurate term in this case. It's uh, uh, it's, it's plant killer. Uh, corn gluten meal. Let's talk about corn gluten meal real quick. Corn gluten meal is the only product out there that is marketed and has ever shown any kind of efficacy as having any pre-emergent benefits or qualities against the crab grass in turf. Now it's a it's a byproduct of uh, it's, feed, it's, it's a feed grade product of the corn milk process. It can be fed to livestock. You can eat corn gluten meal. It's not gonna hurt you unless you're sensitive to corn. Uh, about nine percent nitrogen so it does it is a natural fertilizer. And the proteins in the corn gluten act on those germinating seeds to to stop root growth. It will not let them make a root and, and, and take off and grow. Assuming the conditions work right. Now, uh, this Dr. Nick Christian from Iowa State University discovered this back in the 80s, I guess, and had these qualities. And he found that uh, by the third year, that's when you got some maximum control, it was going to work at all. Uh, weather conditions had a lot to do with how well it worked, uh, had to be very specific. A lot of folks have had difficulty uh, duplicating the results that, they, that, that, that the folks at Iowa State had. Okay? But if you're going to use corn gluten meal, you apply it in the spring, you apply it again in the fall of the year. You got to water it in, either through rain or through irrigation after it's been applied, and then allow the area to dry for two or three days. The dry period following the, 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 the emergence of the seedlings is essential for those things to dry up. Okay. Now, if you have excessive rain or, or continuing rain after you apply the product after weed seed germinate, it'll continue. It will typically grow through. Okay, it'll grow through it, so it didn't work. So, you know, weather conditions have to be right. Uh, probably uh, beds, and flower beds, plant beds, it's easier to have better success because you can manipulate the environment a little bit. Okay, you can manipulate that environment. It's easier to water smaller spaces, put that water out there. Uh, it's not as expensive because you're not talking about huge areas. Uh, the use rate on, on corn in the middle per square foot, or excuse me, per thousand square foot in the lawn is 20, 20 pounds per thousand. It gets very pricey. It gets very pricey. Non-selected weed control, okay? That means, you know, Roundup is a non-selected weed control product. It kills, broadleaf plants kill grasses. Acetic acid, anyway, will kill grasses and broadleaf plants. Acetic acid and salt mixtures, okay? Household acetic, uh, household vinegar is probably gonna be no more than 10% acetic acid, probably even 10, 11%. Percent. Sometimes you may find it down around 5%. That's not super strong. There are horticultural vendors, and you can buy those. You'll see them, they're about 20% acetic acid. That's enough to burn. Okay, I mean, if you got to understand it, it causes some, some, some burn. But you can, I want to show you a picture. You can take uh, uh, just household vinegar and salt, and you can increase 
the toxicity, if you will, or you, you can make it stronger. The acetic acid, uh, the vinegar and the salt combination tends to be stronger than just the household vinegar combination by itself. Okay. Flame weeder, do you guys know the flame weeder? I'll show you a picture of one. Plant oil based herbicide. You'll see those uh, on the shelves that the uh, garden centers will sell organic products. Uh, um, clove oil, for example. You'll see that there. But it just, it just desiccates the top. It burns it, burns the foliage. What it does, it desiccates the foliage. It kills from the top thing. It's not going to translocate in and kill a root. So it works better on annual plants. It works better on smaller annual plants that don't have enough energy stored in the root system to regrow a stem above grain. Okay, that's where it works the best. Uh, here you go. Goosegrass is right out here in our parking lot. Goosegrass untreated. Goosegrass treated with salt water or a, a vinegar and salt mixture. It'll flat burn it up. It will. It'll burn it up. Now, this was fairly mature. So it's already making seed head. Up here you can see the seed head on the goosegrass. When it gets that mature, it's iffy as to whether or not that root system has enough energy to grow up back. Uh, now, it did not in that case. Of course, it grew on the edge of a parking lot too, so it was cold. <laughs> but, out in, out in a garden spot or a garden path. That's where you can use these things where you don't, where you want to kill growth. Okay, you're not worried about, you know, killing this, not killing that. We like to keep paths clean and set and borders, things like that. The smaller the weed, when you control it, or you, 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 you apply that, typically the better results will be. What would be the mixture with the vinegar and salt? That mixture right there was a gallon of white vinegar with enough of it poured out to, to, so that you could add a pound of box of salt. Oh, God. Yeah, well, I just said, you know, if you buy a pound box of salt, you got to pour some of the vinegar off. And, it's, and then, and then you make pickles too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, so. plant something else after you do that. I said, oh, to deal like that, I mean, just immediately, because you, you didn't have enough salt, you didn't have enough vinegar, not going to hurt you. I mean, there's not enough, there's not enough seed of gas. Now, if you, now, can you salt an area and kill the plants that look? If you salt an area that much, then you're going to have a long time to plant that. It depends on how much rainfall you get, what the composition of the soil is, a clay soil is going to hold on to it longer than a sandy soil will. So, you know, that stuff is safe. I know that there are folks that have bought an old farmstead and they have a smokehouse there. And they've got a smokehouse down and they try to grow stuff with a smokehouse. Well, it can't grow it because of the years of salt accumulation. You know, it's, it's, I don't know how it's going to be you know, to be sure, you ought to go and excavate that dirt and place it. I guess it's going to grow something very soon. But salt will kill stuff, no doubt about it. But it will also, if you want to sterilize the ground, salt it hard. Okay, it'll sterilize it for a long period of time. I don't know how much it would take to do that. But a deal like this, you're not putting much out there because you're just you're, all your now. The sunnier the day, the hotter the day, the faster it works. Okay, the sunnier, the hotter the day, the faster it works. Well, well you're doing it back pretty good because there's salt and roads down and you can see on the edge of the road. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, this, you're not putting enough salt out there, no vinegar, it hurt the grain. Okay. So um, you're just foliar applying the oh, plant, not the ground. Mix it up as a spray, that's right. Now, you know, do you cut it with water? I don't know. You know what direction don't come with this stuff? You read these home remedies, oh, this is a great alternative. And it tells you how to mix it up. It's go spray the yard. How much do you spray the yard? It doesn't say. You don't know. You don't know so you're guessing. So that was just mixed pure spray bottle. Just spray it on there. Okay. But you need to change your mind after like you said the smokehouse, you need to decide you want the smokehouse there in my garden later on. If you put lots of it out there, that's right. That's right. I'd rather have the ham and the, 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 uh, just, yeah. <laughs> just, now there's a flame leader. Right there. That's what it is. They work really good. They work really good. This is propane tank. You got a you got a hand torch on it. You burn it. You burn it hot enough. I mean, you'll kill a root for it. I mean, you kill dandelion roots for those. But as a kid, uh, grew, on, grew up on the farm. I bought my daddy a uh, uh, from Sears Roebuck. You know, that's back when you buy stuff from Sears Roebuck and ship it to you or ship it to the store. You go to the store and pick it up. I mean, ship it to your house. But uh, this thing called a flamethrower. And oh, it's pretty cool. Well, that's one of the coolest sounds in advertising. But it was a it was a tank, you know, a metal tank, and you used kerosene as a fuel. And it had the you know pump system on it. It had a burner out here. You'd fire that thing up. You could burn a lot of stuff with it, but it's still a lot of work. But uh, you know, the deal is those flame weeders can work in a lot of places. If you want to go through and keep an edge clean, the border clean, you know, fence rail cleaned out, those are tools that can work for you. And plus, you can uh, melt the ice off the driveway. Just get the asphalt driveway. Be careful on melt asphalt. Because at some point, crabgrass grew there previously. 
and it was allowed to make seeds and no seed were deposited in the ground so it, it made a deposit in the seed bank and that sort of thing. And, it, and, and it, these annual plants are such prolific seed producers that they put lots of seed in the ground and some of those are going to germinate the next year and the year after that and the year after that if you don't do something to stop from doing that. Okay? Well, good growing practices, promoting the crop versus uh, you know, conditions to favor the crop versus conditions to favor the weed, those things all help. Okay? But by, by cutting weeds down, by keeping the tops mowed out of weeds, before they can make seeds, not allowing them to make seeds, by pulling them out of the garden, by holding them out of the garden, by pulling them out of flower bed, by digging them out of flower bed before they make seed, that's a way to keep that seed bank down so that you don't keep building the, the, the amount of seed that goes into the seed bank. Uh, mulch is good for controlling weeds, so if a little bit is good, a lot must be better, right? No. No. If you want to kill some trees, if you want to kill some other shrubs, Use the old volcano approach. Look at this thing. Now this is, I'm not gonna tell you where this is, it's here in Murfreesboro. The folks that live in this place, they pay a lot of money for their houses. And this is at the entrance way. There is about, okay, that's about knee high. Right that's about knee high. You, you, you know, mulch, mulch is good, mulch will control the weed from because you shade the ground, okay? And those little seeds don't have enough energy to push through three inches of mulch. But they can push through three, so I guarantee they can push through two feet. All right, but also, lots of other stuff can't go through two feet either. Like water can't penetrate two feet worth of that mulch when it packs down. Air can't penetrate two feet worth of that mulch when it packs down. It just sheds water off of it like, like a goose down. All right, when it gets dry like that, it fills water. You ought to be able to see the root flare of these trees. When, when they meet the ground level, you look in the woods, those roots flare out like that. The, the butt of the tree flares out. That's that thing's buried in there 18 inches. And top of that tree, right when that picture was made, that's three years ago, it was big and top of the tree. It's down from the top down. So mulch is good, okay, in the right amounts. You don't ever need more than a three inch layer of mulch. Three inches is going to do the good that mulch is going to do. It doesn't have to be hardwood mulch. Newspaper in the vegetable garden works good. Newspaper put down, you clean a flower bed good, put newspaper down and put mulch, decorative mulch over. It'll help suppress weed growth, it will. Plus, you know, newsprint decomposes, it's just cellulose, it's going to add organic matter. So, okay, things like that. Plastic. Plastic, will, will plastic keep weed growth down? Sure it will. It will also inhibit air moving in the soil, it will inhibit water moving in the soil. So, uh, if you want to kill stuff, go, go, go lay a sheet of plastic out uh, today and leave it there for the next six weeks. You can kill a lot of ground like that. And then have a place to plant a fall garden if you want to. Okay, that's, you know, natural weed control. It works pretty good. But it works good in hot times of the year. But don't use it for much. Uh, disease control, most of them are caused by fungi, fewer organic fungicides than are insecticides. And fungicides, fungicides don't cure diseases. They protect plants from infection. That's what they do. So, uh, it's better to be proactive with application of these fungicides than it is to be reactive to okay, we're just about to do a crunch. Sulfur, copper, boiled oil mixture, neem oil. We'll talk about each one just real quick. Sulfur, just what it is, sulfur, elemental sulfur, powdered sulfur. You can apply it as a, as a granule or it can be mixed and sprayed over. It stops fungal, uh, for spore germination. It'll inhibit that, all right? Uh, you can't use it with temperatures above 80 degrees. You cannot use it if oil has been applied in the last month because it'll cause a toxic reaction and cause to burn on the foliage of the plant. But it, it can be effective on things like powdery mildew, black spot on the roses right here. This is cedar apple rust on leaves. Okay. Now, fungicide, it doesn't matter if it's a synthetic fungicide or uh, an organic fungicide, it's not going to clear these leaves up. They'll never look at the ground at the time. All fungicides do are protect uninfected foliage. So that's why you need to be proactive. Put them out there before disease hits or when it first shows up so that you can minimize the damage. Uh, copper fungicides. Copper ions have efficacy against both bacteria and against fungi. So, so they can work against bacterial diseases as well as fungal diseases. There's a product called Bordeaux mixture that combines copper sulfate and lime, which is calcium hydroxide. Uh, now, you gotta pay attention to temperature cautions on copper products. If it's above 85 degrees, you're probably gonna cause some damage to the plant. But anybody have, uh, uh, let's say, arboviodase, or you have juniper and things like that, they get tip lights, cavitated tip light. Uh, uh, circo uh, oh, I can't think of it. A uh, burkman's black, tips of those needles. 
Okay, copper products didn't work on those. Okay, to provide some control for them. But you got to pay attention to the uh, the heat, the time of the year. Uh, bacterial spot on the English ivy right here. Shot hole disease in laurels. If you've got laurels, okay, you're going to see shot hole in them one way or another. If it's if you got a bad problem, you're going to see lots of holes. There's a minimal problem, you see a few holes. There can be fungal shot hole, there can be bacterial shot hole. Canker disease on, uh, on cherries and things like that. Copper fungicides can have efficacy against those. This is fire blight. Fire blight is caused by bacteria. Copper fungicides is, is half of the control program for protecting plants against fire blight. Okay, apple trees, pear trees are against fire blight. The first part is treat them with an antibiotic, streptomycin, when the blooms open up. But then during the uh, the, the dormant time of the year, you treat the trees with the uh, copper fungicide, or those or something like that. Neem oil, again, uh, powdery mildew, downy mildew, leaf spots. Uh, if you've got heavy disease pressure with things like neem oil, don't count on don't count on having great success. Okay, again, it works better than light disease pressure before you really have a problem showing up. Neem oil is not that super good. Uh, at protecting when your disease conditions are high. Good practice is to minimize disease pressure. You know, if sunlight can get to the plant, then dries out faster. Sunlight can kill a lot of organisms, can kill a lot of pests. So you don't crowd plants too much. Give it room for sun to get to them, give room for air to move to them, dry foliage off. What are conditions necessary for diseases to grow? You gotta have a susceptible plant, you've got to have a good environment, you've got to have the organisms affected. Well, the organisms are opportunistic. They're out there in the environment. Susceptible plants, if you plant a susceptible plant, then you give it the second part that it needs of the three to, to, to cause a problem. And then conditions. Most, most fungal diseases need moisture. Okay? So you don't typically have as much disease pressure in dry weather as you have in wet weather. Mild weather conditions, humid weather conditions tend to favor disease development, more so than do low humidity weather. So planting so that you've got room for air to move through there. Overhead irrigation is, a, is an efficient way to water a lot of ground. It may not be the efficient way to use water to go a lot of ground in a hurry. But also, you're wetting foliage. And if that foliage stays wet on up into the evening after sunsets, then you create an environment there that's more favorable for those diseases start to grow, for those fungi to start to grow, and that moisture on those susceptible plant leaves. So using drip irrigation, soaker type irrigation, ground applied irrigation can help minimize conditions that favor disease development. That's all part of it. Uh, put them in the right spot, okay? If it's a, if it's a shade level plant, if you plant it full of sun, it's gonna suffer. If it's, a, if it's a sun plant and you plant it in the shade, it's never gonna be as strong as it would be otherwise, okay? Pay attention to things like that. Choose bulletproof plants. If you find a bulletproof plant, be sure and tell everybody because nobody knows what it is. But, <laughs> but some plants are more problematic than others. If you ever plant a Leland cypress, don't come to plant to us at the extension office. I'm sick and tired of hearing about Leland cypress dying. They're all going to die. Okay, they will. They're all going to die. Good gosh in my uh, I mean, they are. They're, just, they're the new bracket pears. Bracket pears break, the Leland cypress die. That's what they're going to do. They get sick back. My neighbor planted a whole row of them to separate this house, and I went out there and I told them. Don't give them a phone.